they have to buy the lease, then they have to sell the fish to the distributors that are controlled by Rome and by Herod. Uh, usually the fish was smoked or turned into fish sauce for export in the Pax Romana, meaning most of the time you couldn't eat the fish you caught because of the imperial economy. And you know who sold those fishing leases? The tax collectors, which is why it's very interesting in the Gospel of Mark that first you get called the call of fishermen and the next thing you get is the call of a tax collector. Jesus is a disciple of John. John is killed by Herod. Herod controls the fishing industry. Jesus is organizing a movement and the first people he calls are the very people most disenfranchised by empire. And what does he invite them to do? Follow me, he says, and I will make you fish for people. So the radical discipleship movement has struggled mightily against decisionism and um, peer pressure to get saved. And we might uh, benefit from a little more of that, particularly in the non-evangelical liberal circles um, who wouldn't know an altar call if it was on a big screen TV in front of them. Um, Jesus' call to discipleship is not just about a personal relationship with Jesus, although it is that uh, and needs to be that. But it's about being a part of Jesus' movement, about following Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth was an action-oriented figure in the prophetic tradition. He uh, did it as well as, well as told it. Uh, and today we have to figure out what it means to recontextualize the kind of symbolic actions in which Jesus spoke truth to power. You can see the defiance of white power against any uh, semblance of change. Now this is only a dramatic uh, representation of the kind of resistances that are in all of our bones. Even though in our culture we have absolute property rights, from the biblical uh, economic vision, there is no such thing as absolute property rights. The poor have rights to everything that is owned. How are we going to stand for justice in the public arena when all that stuff is swirling inside of us? And so. You know, that's, that's why you just can't have an outward movement without inward journey and contemplation and, um, and, and all of that prayer. You gotta, as soon as you get saved, you've got to hook up with a local fellowship of believers. You know, that's really true. That's even more true for the radical discipleship movement. Uh, if we're going to stay in this thing, we'd better know who our, and this gets back, Greg, to your question, we, we better know who our kindred spirits are and we'd better seek them out. Even our good work gets in the way of our community with each other. And, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's no place where workaholism is greater than in activist circles and church circles. There is always a cost to discipleship. Uh, you know, and Bonhoeffer, you know, who sort of wrote the book on this question, um, was very clear that the joy and the grace of discipleship far outweighs any of the cost. And, and, that, and that's my experience. Let's rebuild the church as a movement and let's rediscover church in our movement. That's how we will heal this thing. Jesus is not just calling for our hearts, friends. He is calling for our hearts, but he's calling us to join a movement to completely transform the world. Jesus' call to discipleship isn't going to settle for just personal transformation. It's a call to, tr to uh, transform, as we say in the States, the whole enchilada, everything. Everything.